Okay, so Simon, thank you for taking the time to answer to the questions. Uh, can you start by introducing yourself? My name is Simon Hanna. I'm a, a member of anti-capitalist resistance in England and Wales. And I'm a branch secretary of Lambeth Unison, which is a union that covers local government workers and health workers across the country. Okay, thank you. Can you start by coming back on, you know, what happened during this the summer, the last summer in uh, in England and United Kingdom, and especially what we saw from France, like, you know, general strikes or a few days of general strikes? Mm. So uh, the background is we've had a conservative government since 2010. Um, there has been no wage increases. Um, most workers have lost pay in real terms. So workers in my um, industry, we've lost 20% of our pay since 2010. Um, and now with inflation in the UK at about 12%, uh, obviously people are really struggling. So um, everything's going up, energy bills, food, transport, housing. And some people are really uh, finding it very hard to be able to pay for those things. So people are really having to choose between heating their homes or being able to eat and feed their family. So there's been a number of uh, fights around wages which have emerged, um, been led by our most industrially well-organized sections, which is the rail and postal workers. Uh, and they've balloted and they've had huge returns from their members uh, for strike action. So they've started a series of uh, strikes. Um, a lot of them are overlapping um, or even being coordinated. Um, and it's a real it's a real shift because in, in, in Britain for years, um, strike levels have been very low. Uh, workers haven't been feeling very confident or, or, or very well organized to take action, but people are very inspired by what is going on at the moment. Okay, can you explain it? What was uh, the the action and the part of the government, uh, you know, in answering to the crisis, the social, the social crisis that you were talking about? So the government has offered public sector workers um, some wage increases. So between 3% and 7%. Uh, but if inflation's at 12%, then that means all of these wage increases are actually wage cuts. <clears throat> so the government has said they don't want to give any more money. Uh, the economists are saying they don't want to create what they call an inflation spiral when wages go up and that adds to inflation more generally. Obviously, our argument is that our wages should keep up with inflation. If inflation is at 12%, then wages should be at 12%. Why are we the ones that are having to, to suffer? So the government has really been trying to resist acting. Um, the only thing it has done uh, since Boris Johnson was removed by his party and replaced by Liz Truss, sh her government announced a new um, budget uh, just a few weeks ago, which proposed cutting the top rate of tax for the richest people as well as corporations and borrowing billions of pounds in order to help pay people's energy bills because the energy bills are the thing that are causing the most concern at the moment. So rather than nationalizing energy um, or taking any steps like that, what they're just doing is borrowing money and then just giving it straight to the energy companies. But the international money markets didn't like this plan. Um, borrowing is very expensive and they weren't sure the UK government would be able to keep up with the interest payments. So it really tanked the UK stock exchange, the pounds really collapsed, uh, pension funds were being threatened with collapsing, uh, and the Bank of England had to intervene with 65 billion pounds just to try and buy up some of the government debt, which is causing a real crisis. So the Conservative Party's in a real mess. Lots of people don't trust uh, Liz Truss. They don't think she's very good at handling the issue. Um, and this is creating more opportunities for workers to put forward more militant demands. Okay, so from France, where the only thing that we were hearing about is that Liz Truss is the new Thatcher. Uh, what can you say about that? Because we heard also about the, the anti-union and, you know, the obstacles hmm. about the mobilization. Hmm. Can you talk about that? I think Liz Truss uh, wants to be the new Thatcher. Um, I think the major difference is Thatcher came in in 1979 with a very clear agenda to rip up the welfare state destroy social democracy and really reorganize the British economy, um, that's already largely been done. So Liz Truss's project now is this kind of extreme version of Thatcherism, which is so extreme that even the uh, international 
you know, money markets and banks are finding it too much, which is what caused the economic problem of the last few weeks, which hasn't gone away. I mean, there's the Bank of England money might run out on fr on Friday, and then the you know the British economy could go off a cliff over the weekend. So there's real instability, and I think trust wants to be the new Iron Lady and be able to control it all. But um, I don't think she's popular with her party. The Tories have already been in power for 12 years, so a lot of the problems they're dealing with are problems that they created. So it's it's not quite the same. Uh, it's not quite the same moment of history as what as what Margaret Thatcher represented. But there is some things that the Tories are doing. They brought in new laws which really restrict the right to protest. It's now people could potentially go to six months for organising a protest uh, in the UK now. They want to bring in new anti-union laws um, which will make it even harder for uh, workers to be able to meet ballot thresholds. So at the moment you have to have at least a 50% turnout and a majority for strike action but now they want to have it where you have to have at least 50% of all the members eligible to vote will be uh, uh, um, uh, have to be met and then you can have the strike action. It's going to make it very hard in some of the bigger sections of the working class like in local government or in health where you're talking hundreds of thousands of workers. So um, <clears throat> that's, that's going to be a new obstacle which we'll have to deal with. One of the very exciting things over the summer though is there was a whole wave of wildcat strikes. There was wildcat strikes in the uh, North Sea oil rigs. Um, there, was not, there was wildcat strikes in Amazon, the first strike in, in the UK by Amazon warehouse workers, um, you know, which is a real uh, shift now for us that these workers are, a lot of them were ununionized, they just walked out. Um, and so there's that kind of energy now amongst some, some of the new sections of the working class to be able to take action. So, yeah, that's very positive, but obviously we've always got obstacles to overcome. Okay, and on the situation, what we saw from France, like, you know, during the last week was only the question about the death of the Queen. Mm. And what we saw that, and especially the strikes were um, stopped in order to mourn for at least 11 days, something like that. So what's actually the situation now? Well, uh, in, in the UK, uh, we still have a royal family. We're not lucky like comrades are in France that you have a republic. Um, the, the Queen and the royal family still enjoy a lot of support, um, kind of soft support, you know, not real hardened monarchists, but people just, they like the Queen. She's been around for 50 years, you know, she was seen as this kind of nice, kind of elderly uh, figure who was just doing a good job. So. I think there was a real feeling across the nation of uh, this kind of national mourning, which was kind of enforced as well, but that was the situation. And the unions that were taking action that week, so the railway workers and the postal workers called off their action. They suspended it um, for a later date. There was lots of criticisms around this. I think one of the main criticisms was that <clears throat> it was kind of giving in to this wave of national grief, which meant that the class war was effectively suspended on our side, but obviously the cost of living crisis was still being felt by workers and the poor. So um, it's not that the bosses called off their attacks, we had to call off our strikes. And the other issue is that the unions just kind of called the strikes off. They didn't really, <coughs> they didn't really consult their members around it. And I think this points to another problem that the strikes are good, but they're very top down. There's no real rank and file organizational coordination of the strikes. Um, there's lots of very militant people in the unions that are doing good work on the ground, but the strikes are all controlled really nationally. Um, and I think that needs to shift. We need to have more coordination locally between trade unions in different sectors. And there needs to be a bit of a push against the anti-union laws so that we can actually organise strike action that can win. What's coming next? Are there like uh, dates? for, you know, the same day everyone is going to strike or mm. what's next? What's coming next? Okay, so the, in terms of new organisations that have been set up, there's um, uh, new campaign groups like Enough is Enough, which is a campaign that's been set up by the Postal Workers Union and the Railway Workers Union, uh, as well as some others. Um, it's had a series of rallies across the country, which have been very well attended. Thousands of people have come out. Um, it's got a bit of the energy that we had in 2015 around the Jeremy Corbyn election campaign. Um, so far it hasn't, it's, it's also called some actions which are kind of local rallies, but it hasn't yet set up an organisation as such. <clears throat> um, but there's clearly a lot of people who are very excited and enthusiastic to be part of something, so we'll have to see how that develops. 
There's another organisation called Don't Pay UK, which is specifically trying to organise people to refuse to pay their energy bills. And it's modelled on the anti-poll tax protests of the late 80s and early 90s, where the Thatcher government, one of the last things it did was bring in this flat tax that everyone had to pay. Lots of people couldn't afford it. So it was a can't pay, won't pay coalition. And that's what they're trying to do with the Don't Pay UK campaign now, which is that some people literally can't afford their energy bills. Some people don't think they should pay them because they're too high. So that's been kind of offset a bit because the government has borrowed all this money to pay some of the money on energy bills. But energy bills are still very high. Uh, the money's not going to be there forever. Um, and it's really important that campaigners are trying to turn what is a social crisis into a political crisis. Because if someone is just at home with no money, struggling to eat, struggling to heat their home, that's, that's a personal crisis for them. But if those people can be organised and network together and begin to take to the streets and organise actions and talk about their situation, then it becomes a political movement. And therefore it can begin to put demands on the government and it can begin to fight th for things. So that's kind of the stage we're in at the moment. There's still more strikes happening. Uh, the um, teachers are being balloted, nurses are being balloted, um, college workers have come out on strike. We've had an all-out strike by criminal barristers, like public um, advocates, uh, who uh, want a 15% pay increase. So there's lots of things developing now. Um, <clears throat> there is beginnings of some coordinations, but the unions still kind of stick to their own timetables and agendas sometimes. But there are people talking about a general strike. A general strike in Britain would be illegal. Um, you can only strike against your <coughs> sorry, you can only strike against your employer, but there is hope that we can coordinate more strikes and begin to create a bit of energy from below, where people feel more confident to begin to take action, even people that aren't in trade unions at the moment. So, on the question of perspective and what we can do, because you know we are internationalist, and so and the questions that are asking the strikes and the movements <coughs> in Great Britain, you know, are the same that people are asking in France about salaries, about question of taxes, energy, mm. and so on. Uh, what we can do to help it? Well, I think all attempts at international coordination are good. I think it's really important that workers know about what's going on in other countries. There's so many attempts by the capitalist class to divide us and make us ignorant about what's going on. Uh, for instance, there's this strike of petroleum workers going on in France at the moment, which is causing a real national crisis, but that's not talked about in Britain at all. So I think it's really important to spread that knowledge and to make sure people are inspired by what is going on in other countries. For instance, the recent uh, um, strike by oil workers in Iran in support of the women's movement there, which is really inspirational and shows you know, the power and organised working class begins to get involved in protest movements. So I think that's, that's very important. Uh, I think, you know, <clears throat> I came into action, uh, like I came into political life around the, the anti-capitalist movement when we had the European Social Forums and the World Social Forums and I feel that it would be really good if we could try and build those kind of things again because having those kind of discussions from activists, workers, um, social movement activists and so on from all kinds of different countries is not only just inspirational but really important because you can begin to talk about strategy and what you can do together. And I think really what the left has to do is we have to try our best to put socialism back on the agenda. You know, what's going on with the rise of the far right? They've just taken power in Italy, um, in France. Uh, Le Pen is a very powerful political figure. Um, there's, you know, the growth of the far right in, 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 in countries across the world, even in Brazil, where Lula has just come first in the first round of the presidential elections. But Bolsonaro came a very close second, got another three million votes. Trump is still very popular in the United States. There's a real danger that as the economic and social crisis begins to spiral and polarisation happens, that it's the far right that are the beneficiaries. And then, you know, that's going to be a very... Uh, terrible outcome for people across the world because those people don't offer a future all they offer is reaction and violence and hate and it's up to the left we need to be more confident we need to be more active well organized more internationalist in our perspective because we're the ones that are gonna have to fight to win the future <laughs>